Anguttur Nikaya 3.65, commonly referred to as simply the Kalama Sutta. Thank you for choosing to join us this afternoon. Uh, we now have the pleasure to welcome and introduce our speaker, Sis Silver Bay. This is what we're going to cover today. First, I will offer an introductory thought about the Kalama Sutta. Then I'll take you through four sections. The sections are in different colors to flesh out that distinction and to allow you a sense of their relative space, the relative space that they occupy in that sutta. Okay? And then I'll offer some concluding thoughts. Some introductory thought. Many of you may be under the impression that the Kalama Sutta is about Buddhist epistemology, right? Buddhist epistemology. What, what does the big word epistemology mean? It means theory of truth. In other words, what do we know? How do we know? How do we know that we know about the world? Okay? Theory of truth means, you see, if you look at the world, how do you know that you know this is the world? How do we know that? How? Buddhist theory of truth means, what do we know? How do we know? And how do we know that we know? This thing is very important because if you look at the way that we look at the world, how do you know that this is the world? How do you know that this world is real? How do you know that you know what you know is correct and is real? So all this, this is a philosophical, it's, a, it's an entire field of study. It's epistemology and the Western world is very big on this. Okay. Now, Kalama Sutta, because of certain components within the Sutta, for a long time, people will just look at Kalama Sutta and say, oh, the Kalama Sutta is about Buddhist epistemology. Actually, that's not true. It is not about epistemology per se. If you look at Kalama Sutta, it is found in the Anguttara Book of Three. Anguttara Nikaya means it's a collection where the suttas are in numbered order. So book of one, book of two, book of three, and so on. Okay? Meaning, meaning a book in the book of, say, three, there will be three components the Buddha will highlight to you. In the book of five, there will be five factors or five, five conditions that Buddha will highlight. So Kalama Sutta is captured in book of three, not book of ten. Why ten? Because we, I will flesh out to you later. There are ten elements that he fleshed out as one should not go by these ten and assume that's the truth. Okay? So because it's found in the book of three, there must be something else there that the Buddha wanted to highlight to us. So this talk, the key objective of the talk is to help us all have a deeper appreciation of this sutta. This sutta, in my view, is very critical to understand properly and to apply in our daily life. Any sutta should be appreciated in terms of how we apply it. It's not enough to just understand. You have to apply. Apply means make it relevant to your daily life. Okay. And I said earlier, I'm going to hide, I'm going to divide them into segments. You look at the colors. A is in khaki green. It will cover the, 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 the portion that talks about the limitation of conventional sources of knowledge. B is in blue. This is the knowable truths. C, the joy of noble living. It's in purple. And D, four comforts. I call it brownish orange. Okay? So you look out for the colors. Okay. Uh,
First one, the first section, limitation of conventional sources of knowledge. We know that the sutta, a long sutta, typically starts like this. So I have heard. At one time, the Buddha was wandering the lands of the Kosalans. When he arrived at the town of the Kalamas, named Kesamutta, the name of the town is Kesamutta. The residents of that town are, are the Kalamas. Okay. And in the time of the Buddha, very often the identity of the individual sits with his family and the land that he's from. So I am like the Buddha, I'm Sakyan. He was a Sakyan from Kali, uh, uh, Kapilawatu. That's, that's how he would have been known, a Sakyan from Kapilawatu. So this is a Kalamas of Kesamutta. And this sutta is called Kesamutia, Kesamutta Sutta. Okay? The Kalamas of Kesamutta heard. It seems the ascetic Gautama, a Sakyan gone forth from a Sakyan family, has arrived at Kesamutta. He has this reputation. And the reputation of the Buddha was that five qualities that we recite today. Iti piso bhagava arahan samma sambuddho vidya charana sampano, etc. etc. Those were his qualities. People knew him to be to possess those qualities. And that's very important because in the old days there was no internet. There was no there was no uh, newspaper. And then how do you know when a teacher is coming to town? How do you know what is that teacher famous for? What is he good at? And this nine qualities of the Buddha is a summary of what he was known for. His strengths, his qualities that people appreciated. So next time when you recite Iti Piso Bhagawa Sparahan and so on and so forth, Spare a thought to reflect on those qualities. For those were the very qualities that make the Buddha this special, that special. Okay? So the Kalamas went up to the Buddha and basically, when, this, I kept this stanza because I want you to see for yourself what is captured in the sutta, how his contemporaries interacted with him. They went to him, before they sat down, some of them bowed, some exchanged greetings, meaning they say, hello, sir, I am so-and-so, how are you, something like that. They made polite conversation. It's your pa, boy. have you eaten? They will ask, something along that line. Huh? Of course, you don't ask, have you eaten in the afternoon? Huh? Some held up, their palms towards the Buddha, some announced the name and clan, and others kept silent. Buddha was not particular. And for centuries, the monks were not particular. The fact that they recorded it like this, they didn't say here that everyone bowed and kissed his feet and they, they professed their love and so on. So they said nothing. They had it very simple. It, they, were, they were greeting a regular person in their mind. He's a teacher, a great teacher, but he's a man like us. So this little stanza here tells you in his time, no one treated him differently from a man. Okay. Seated to one side, the Kalamas said to the Buddha, there are, sir, some ascetics and Brahmins who come to Kesamutta, they explain and promote only their own doctrine while they attack, badmouth, disparage, and smear the doctrines of others. Then some others, they come and they do exactly the same thing. So this point here, Kesamutta is a place where all kinds, all shades of ascetics and Brahmins. Why this differentiation? Buddha belonged to the ascetics category, the shramanas category. 
they are they were practitioners who rejected the the conventional religion of the day the conventional religion of the day was the vedic faith okay the vedas so there are there were a group of people who rejected the vedas and they chose to try and find out for themselves what is truth and all these individuals who rejected the vedas they were called shramanas buddha being one of them and the fact that so many came to a point where this this kalamas were distraught it tells you that this place the this kesamutta must have been rich it must have been rich it must have been prosperous there must have been educated people then people want to go if you are the bahamas in the middle of the ocean and nothing is there why would people go you understand so kesamutta was probably a bustling place with a lot of opportunities for donation and conversion of of vice versa for conversion and donation in the old days the more disciples you have the bigger is your pool of financial support so a lot of these guys would go would descend on kesa mutta trying to convert people to their their teaching so kesa mutta said the, the the sorry the kalama said we are doubting and uncertain i wonder who of these respected ascetics and brahmins speak the truth and who speaks false hood okay this this part here to bear in mind huh? now i will explain a little bit about the kalamas the kalamas came to him perplexed torn between being receptive and being skeptical two the kalamas had critical thinking they were intelligent they they had some wisdom why do i say they were intelligent had some wisdom they descended on spiritual speakers philosophers with the intent to learn from them what what were their teachings how do they see the world how do they understand the world and i said educated with a inverted comma because in the old days there was there was no such thing as educated per se there was no formal education there was no formal schools but they had system of transferring knowledge from one generation to another and if you were in a position to learn from others and learn in a dedicated and consistent way you are you were educated so that's the idea i want to highlight the profile of the audience because this today is your regular audience there will be many in the audience who are perplexed perplexed means they have doubts they have doubts they are a bit concerned they they worry they are distracted the idea okay why do i say torn between receptive and being skeptical if you were not even receptive why are you even there listening why would people even sit down to listen the fact that they sit down they attend a talk means they want to hear they want unless it's your mother who forced you to go but otherwise anyone who who attend a talk wants to know more if there is that wanting to know they will make an effort to be receptive but because they had all the other doctrines flooding their mind and if they were contradictory if the teachings were contradictory they can't help judging they can't help comparing so this is what what was happening the kalamas were comparing they were listening they were half receptive they were half thinking and arguing in their mind and so on and so forth okay and i highlighted this because i want to point out again i'm going to repeat this point this is an audience today typical audience today it's watch how the buddha handled this huh? 
I asked this question, what was the audience asking? I will spare a few seconds for you to have this point sink in. What was the audience asking? I'm not waiting for an answer. I'm waiting for you to answer yourself. Have you, if you have thought enough, I will move on. Huh? See, the limitations of Zoom is the audience cannot re reply to you. So I will have to reply to myself. Agree? This is what the audience wanted to know. What is truth? On this point, I need to emphasize, I, I need to highlight certain things. When we use the word truth today, we are actually talking about epistemology. What do we know? How do we know? How do we know that we know? And so on and so forth. This is, I call it the Western philosophical sense, in the sense that they are actually talking about the theory, the theory of how do we know, what do we know, and so on and so forth. What's the applicable values? Irrelevant. To them, that's, that's point two. Right now, we're just focusing on how do we know that we know? Huh? But the ancient Indian audience in the Buddha's time, when they talk about truth, they are not talking about epistemology. They want to know how do we lead a life properly? What is the meaning and the value of life? How do we make sure that going from here, I will be better? I will have a better life. I will have happiness and sense of fulfillment and so on. So for that ancient audience, when they came before the Buddha, they say, what is truth? They're not talking about how do we know truth. They're talking about what do I do? How do I do right or wrong? How do I improve myself in life? You ask yourself this. Most of us sitting down here, I'm, I'm pretty sure... 99% of us sitting down here, I'm pretty sure we're all Chinese, right? And I'm pretty sure that being Chinese, we're very practical people. Meaning, when we, when we think about truth, we will think about hey, how to protect ourselves. How do we make sure that we are okay? And my family is okay. And then we'll get better, that we will improve, that we will not deteriorate, that we are not following something, doing something that makes us more unhappy, make us more, more uh, resentful, make us more disturbed. We don't want that. We want to be better. So for us, what works in terms of improving my welfare, improving my happiness, making us better, nicer people, that's good. Okay? You have to bear this point in mind because the Buddha in his reaction, in his response to the Kalamas was specifically addressing this concern. They want to know who speaks truth, who speaks false with regards to who. How do I lead a better life? And how do I know? Okay. So Buddha's first response, first immediate response, it is enough, Kalamas, for you to be doubting and uncertain. Doubt has come up in you about an uncertain matter. I said this is unusual and unconventional response because if you remember what the Kalamas said, they said everyone who came before them will say that their doctrine is right, is good, is for the better, etc., etc. And other people, they bad mouth. They will disparage. Meaning to say, they promoted their own and they undermined others. Buddha didn't do that. He merely said, ah, correct, correct. I understand. It is a problem. It's, it's, it's fair enough that you have doubts. So he was showing, he was demonstrating sensitivity, empathy and understanding. Why is this step very important? You think about your own relationship with people. 
people come to you and complain. Do you find yourself sometimes dying to answer them and give, give them your ideas, your views? Did, did you even listen to what they were saying? Did they ask you for your opinion? Sometimes they are not. Sometimes they only want to say things and ask for and, 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 and vent. But you are all ready to go and fire away. You are all ready to explain to them this, this, that, and everything. So essentially, what the Buddha did at that point was to show them, the people, the Kalamas, that he understood why they had a problem. And he said it's valid that they had that problem. So he was assuaging them. He was... He was calming them. I put in this phrase, Anuttaro Parisadam Masarati. And this is one of his, this was one, this is, this is one of his qualities, one of the nine qualities. I highlighted this one because this particular example is a brilliant demonstration of his, this phrase, Anuttaro Parisadam Masarati. He was very skilled at helping the human steer. Dhamma, Dhamma here is the steer, the, the, the bullock. And the human bullock, why human bullock? When, until you are tame, until we are tame, we do have very, we behave in very instinctive ways, right? We're angry, we lash out when we are, when we're greedy and we, we thirst for something, we just go grab, just fulfill. Hungry, just go to the kitchen, pull, the, pull open the, wind, uh, the, 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 the fridge and then just grab whatever we like. We behave very instinctively like animals. The one who is tame with restraint does not behave instinctively. Okay, So Buddha was really incomparable. Number one. Number one at helping the wayward human, the, the, the human with problems, with wild habits. He was brilliant at, bring, at helping these human tame their mind. And he was very good at calming them, taming them. Okay? So this response by the Buddha it's something for us to bear in mind. Before we fire off in response to someone, listen. Listen first and help the person calm down first before you start talking. Then he started talking, okay? And this is the famous one. You count, there are 10 of them. Please, Kalamas, don't go by oral transmission. Mark. Anusavena, don't go by lineage, paramparaya, go by testament, and so on and so forth. I will explain each one very quickly. This, this is not the most important part, okay? I'm telling you, in the Kalama Suttas, this is not the most important part. But posters, screensavers, uh, they, they tend to just focus on this portion because they think that Buddha was saying, in all of these, do not take it as truth. That's not what he said. What he said was going by oral transmission. Oral transmission means something which people have heard and they share amongst themselves and it's passed from one person to another. And it's, we're talking about, say, knowledge. Some, 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 some knowledge that you have picked up, but was not recorded anywhere. It was just transmitted verbally. Again, that's oral transmission. Lineage is what you learn from within your family. So your parents say, oh, I learned this from my, my mother. When, when you are pregnant, you must do this, this, this. And after you deliver within that one month, you must do that, that, that. That's going by lineage. No signs on this, just going by lineage. Okay. Testament, basically people talk, people talk, and then they say, it works, I'm telling you, it works. That's testament. 
canonical authority, your pitaka, your collection, your scriptures. Now, just on these four, you reflect on your own life in your, in your regular world. You think about it. How often do you run off thinking, oh, this piece of information must be correct because you think about it. It's quite common, right? I mean, how do you know that, uh, let me see. Let's, let's talk about, let's talk about pregnancy and the man the, the full, that first month of confinement month, right? The old people will say that, oh, you cannot turn on the, the cold, the fan, and don't open the window, and it must be keep kept warm and all. How do you know that it's true? Because old people say so. Oral transmission. Because my family always practice like that. Lineage. Because I read in the book. Pitaka Sampade Danina, canonical authority. You understand what I'm saying? But you think about it. How do we learn the ma? We learn Dhamma via these methods, right? From oral transmission, from lineage, from testament, from canonical authority. We have to do it like that, right? The hell? If the Buddha meant you're not supposed to take any of this thing as gospel truth, then don't need to learn Dhamma. How to learn? So it's not. He's just saying that going by these, by these, not enough to say this is truth. I go on, huh? logic. Inference, reason, contemplation, acceptance of a view after consideration. This is what we go through in here. The first four are information taken from an external source. The next four, sorry, uh, logic, inference, reason, contemplation, acceptance of view. The next four deals with what goes through here. You think it makes sense. You're very happy to say that it, it's the truth. You draw your conclusion from some samples. You said it must be the truth. You think about something in a very superficial way. Ma Diti, this one, uh, except that we have to consideration. This is actually superficial thinking. It's thinking, uh, it's still thinking. You're not even thinking logically here. You're just thinking. And after you think already, you're happy. You say, yes, it's the truth. You, you see what I'm saying? The last two deals with perception of the speaker, appearance of competence. It's that speaker. You listen to someone and he, oh, he speaks perfect English. He is or oh, perfect Mandarin, beautiful articulation. I love his choice of words, blah, 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 blah. And he must be good. How often have we been guilty of that? And the final one is, this is our respected teacher. He has to be right. Based on these alone, they are not enough for us to conclude what is said has to be true. That's the point. It is not that you cannot, you must disregard. He does not say you disregard. He's saying that keep an open mind, don't conclude so quickly. Okay, the reason why the Buddha would advise everyone to be very careful is this. All conventional sources of information and knowledge, all, all of them will be underpinned by moha. Moha, you think about it. The world is completely shrouded in moha, right? We have that problem. If the world is all shrouded by moha, people talk, People share, people say all kinds of things. That information has to sit on moha. It is all. And problem with moha is that it's not wrong per se. But the problem is it's incomplete and it's potentially corrupting. What do I mean by that? If your mind perceives things in a certain way, the danger is that way, that view will then become the platform from which you look at the world, everything else. And if you're not aware that this view is faulty, 
then everything that you see in the world is already corrupted by this view. I will just lay, list down one critical element about Moha, right? or rather three critical elements about Moha. Moha specifically is the inability to see the Dhamma. We don't see the world through a Dhamma lens. What do we mean by that? We don't go around having a sense that craving is Dukkha, the origin of Dukkha craving. We don't go around seeing, we, we see something we like, we want. So straight away, the mind doesn't say, hey, wait, this is origin of craving. See the gratification, see the escape. We don't do things like that. We just, we see, we like, we chase. Point one. Point two, Anicca Dukkha Anatta. We don't see mortality. We don't live our life. We do not live our life assuming that the next minute, one of us here will drop dead. We don't. Or us, specifically us. We will just drop dead. We don't see our, we don't see life like that. We, there is an automatic assumption that life will continue. It is, it's, it's relentless. When it ends, we know it will end some point, but not today and not tomorrow and not next year and not 10 years down, depending on how young or how old you are. Not this, not that, not that. You, you kind of can't, can't wrap your mind around mortality. Certainly, we are still fixated about pleasure. And as long as we are fixated about pleasure, as long as pleasure determines how we want to spend the moment, what choices we make is still, what choices we make are still, are still underpinned by a subtle desire for pleasure. So that's, that's the second moha. And the third one is because of certain way of the mind working, we, we, because of memories, because of ability to project, the sense of self is too strong. So all these, it's moha. All of this, oral tra transmission, lineage, testament, and so on and so forth, a lot of them sits on other people's moha as well as our own moha. So the Buddha was not wrong when he said, don't just go by these, going by these alone, you do not ascertain truth. That was his point. Then how do you ascertain truth? Now, remember what I said earlier to this group of listeners, truth was for happiness and welfare. Truth was concerned with what is good and bad, what should or should not be done. This is the audience. And you like it or not, even today, all of us sitting down here, we are still. Why are you here to learn Kalama Sutras? Because we want to know how to apply it. We know what's, what's so big deal about the Kalama Sutra. How does it affect my life? So what are you interested in? The truth? No. You're interested in how Kalamas or the teaching can be practical, can be used for my welfare or my happiness, right? Therefore, you look at what the Buddha said, the blue partner, when you know for yourselves, these things are unskillful, blameworthy, criticized by sensible people. And when you undertake them, they lead to harm and suffering. You should give them up. I put in the Pali words here because some of these Pali words are very important for to uh, uh, very useful to help us appreciate this stanza better. And some words that you many of you will be very familiar with would be akusala, which Ajahn Sujato has translate had translated as unskillful. Okay, blameworthy. To be, to be uh, censured. And BB means bhikkhu bodhi. Ajahn Sujato translated it as sensible people. Bhikkhu bodhi translated it as wise people, criticized by the wise. Personally, I prefer the word wise. And then, so, so there are certain portions here to pay attention to, and I said, no, this, this segment. Huh? Let me explain. He said, you know for yourself. I put in the word universal. And the reason is this. 
you don't need anyone to tell you, right? That when you see something happening, you see something happening, there is a part in you that know right or wrong, good or bad. Is it for your welfare or not? There's a part in you that know. You can see other people's actions in other people's words or in your own actions, in your own words. You, can, you know. How many of us really like to scold people? We don't. We know it's not nice. We know it's not skillful. Why blameworthy? Why savage? Because anybody looking at that event will say something. You go onto social media today and you can see for yourself that actually many things are universal. They, the, when, 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 the, when the, the, the camera capture someone bullying another and then this video is uploaded, you just go and see how many people, how, when it goes viral, right? how many people will score the bully and will sympathize with the victim. We all, and and the, the response will come from all corners of the world, from all cultures, by all people. And it's almost universal. Criticize, scolding the bully. The more patient one will say, maybe the bully got problem. Huh? So we have a bit more patience. But everyone will sympathize with the victim. Morality is universal. You don't need teachers to teach. You need teachers to remind, affirm, inspire. But you don't need teachers to tell you this is wrong and this is right. So the Buddha is saying here, or was saying here, when it is akusala, when it is sawaja, it will be criticized by wise people, sensible people. Why sensible people? Why, why, why so specific? Ah, because we do know that fools will be the only few who will say, yeah, good, bully her, good, good, this is a good thing. There will still be a few fools. But the bulk of us, we are wise enough, the bulk of us will say it's wrong. This is not, okay? So your three considerations, anything, any action, unskillful, what does it mean? Why this word unskillful? I always say it is very easy to give in to your loba and dosa, your greed and your anger. It's very easy. It's so much harder to exercise, to practice right speech, to not scold, to not complain, to not whine. It's much harder. So if you can do it, you're skillful. Kusala. If you cannot do it, you are like everyone else. Akusala, unskillful. Blameworthy, as I pointed out, within the hearts of men, there is a moral compass. They see something wrong, they will criticize. This is normal, okay? So you look at the action, you know for yourself, you know for yourself, it's unskillful, it's blameworthy. Other people will say you, just as you will say other people. And you know, when you undertake them, it will cause harm and suffering. Comes the third point. Give them First point, knowing something is wrong is not difficult. Second point, recognizing that it causes pain and suffering. Hurt your welfare, cause you pain. That's also not wrong. I mean, that's not difficult. Giving them up, that's the difficult part. And the Buddha, he used the word pajahiyata, should give, should abandon should abandon okay then he went on so it's this point, point. this is a, a second point what do you think Kalamas does greed loba come up in a person for their welfare or harm so the Kalamas replied harm a greedy person Overcome, abibuto, overcome by grief, kill, steal, commits adulteries, lies, and encourage others to do the same. Is it for their lasting? The word here, 
Duk is digaratang. Digaratang actually means for a long time. You know, diga nikaya. Diga nikaya means long, right? Long discourses. Diga rata is long time. Harm and suffering. And they said, yes, sir. Bhante Jato missed out one translation. I put in Bhikkhu Bodhi is because of this phrase. With mind obsessed. Obsessed. Okay. This is the word. A mind that is overwhelmed. Okay. Now, a few points to make here. Number one. Here you see unwholesome motivations arising. It comes up only. Eh? Comes up to cause harm. It arises already your mind is stained. And if you're not careful, the moment it arises, you can be overwhelmed. But if you do not put a stop there and you act on your motivations, it becomes lasting harm and suffering. The point here is you have one shot to jam break and it has to come right at the start. When there is a rising of craving, when there is a rising of craving, you must already put a stop. Does greed come up in a person, arise in a person for welfare or harm? Greed arises for harm. And then he went on to pose the same questions with regards, dorsal, anger, moho, delusion. Dorsal, moho. And Anyone motivated by lobo, doso, moho, loba, dosa, moha, greed, anger, delusion. If those form the basis of your motivations, you will experience diminishing welfare, i.e. harm, and eventually pain, suffering. Okay? So this is a blue section. And then he went on to an entire segment. It's a long segment on, oh, so, sorry, sorry. This is the summary. Huh? This, this is what I call the remedial component. What is knowable truth? What is knowable is the actions motivated by loba, dosa, moha will lead to harm and suffering. That's knowable truth. It's also a noble truth that any action that is akusala, the, the uh, unwholesome action, they will have these components. People will criticize. It will lead to problem. But the main point I want to highlight is they should be abandoned. Understanding above and doing accordingly is being wise. So I said earlier, the fact that an action is unwholesome, you know that you shouldn't do, people will say you, you know that if you were to do it, it will cost you pain, it can cause others pain, not just yourself, others and yourself pain. The fact that you know all these things merely makes you more aware. You're aware. But if you continue to do, you know you shouldn't go but the words come out of the mouth and someone is hit by your angry words. That is, in my mind, doubly unwise or doubly unwise. You, you, are, you, were, you were sharp enough to know and catch that it shouldn't be said, it shouldn't be done. But you have not enough wisdom to hold the line on Kusala and you refuse to let it go. If you refuse to let it go, that is really unwise. Okay, that's the idea. And then he went on in a very big way. So 
what you saw earlier is replicated with Kusala. What do you think Kalamas does? The word used in Pali was alobo, and Biku Bodhi translated it as non greed. Ajahn Sujato translated it as contentment. He basically pushed it one more layer. I prefer to keep the word non greed because non greed, yes, one step further is contentment. Contentment is the ultimate of our lobo, okay? But non-greed, for a start, at least you stay there. And, and then you push. It's, 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 it requires a little bit more practice to make it contentment. So that you're not greedy does not make you content yet. But if you're not greedy, eventually contentment will arise in you. It's, it's, a, it's a slightly uh, different stage of cultivation. So does non-greed come out in a person for their welfare or harm? And of course, it's welfare. And a person who is content, who is, no, who is without greed, he won't be overcome by greed. He doesn't kill, steal, commit adultery, lie, and encourage others to do the same. Is that for their lasting welfare or happiness, sukhaya. This is, welfare is hitaya, okay? And happiness is sukhaya, for their happiness. So, wholesome motivations arising, just having wholesome motivation, just having alobo arising is enough to bring you welfare, to bring welfare. And if it translated into wholesome speech and action, lasting welfare, lasting happiness. If you recall, the component that was green, and now this component that is blue, which one is wider? Which one is bigger? Which one occupied more space? This one, isn't it? This one clearly, Buddha spent a lot of time talking about this. He was already answering their question, but he didn't say this is truth. He said, this is something you all should know. You all know for yourself. You all know that when you do this, motivated by this, this is what happens. If you know so, you should let go. Don't do. So what is good? Any thought, motivate, any thought, speech or action motiv with wholesome motivation is good, should be done. Any unwholesome thoughts, action, speech, motivated by unwholesome motivations, not good should not be done, okay? So he was already teaching them what should or should not be done. But he cast it in such a way that they think it's theirs. They know it themselves. And so therefore, they're more receptive. The third component, the third component here talks about the joy of noble living, okay? You note, huh? In the earlier portion, wait, let me, let me show you previous. You see, uh, what do you think? And then the word here, in Pali is purisa pukala. That, that was the word that he used. Okay, Purisa pukala. Person. Remember this word, huh? person. Then here he used the word noble disciple. It's a differentiation, really. This is where the Buddha injected his teaching, his training, the outcome of the practice, practice on his path. So before, it's a regular person, a regular uh, conventional man, a uh, conventional layman, mostly, because the Kalamas were all laymen. So a conventional person will have loba dosa, moha, a loba, a dosa, a moha. Okay? Loba, dosa, moha, greed, anger, delusion. And he will also have a loba, a dosa, a moha. Non greed, non anger, non action, uh, non, non, non delusion. Little of it, little of it. Okay? This one, a noble disciple, is read of desire. 
I, I put in the Pali words because here the Pali words are beautiful. Vigata. Vigata means gone. Off ready. No more. Okay. Vigata abhija. Abhija. Covetousness. One thing. So a noble disciple, anyone who practiced well on his path, has let go of abhijja, has let go of covetousness, has let go, we got the biyapado, B-Y-A-P-A-D-O, biyapado, let go of ill will. Asam muho, mulho, translated as unconfused, I'll explain a bit later. Sampajano, the word Sampajano pops up in Sati Patana Sutta. Your you with clear understanding, Sampajano. Okay. And Pati Sato, very mindful, clearly mindful. So a noble disciple is read of desire, ill will unconfused, aware, mindful. Because of these mental conditions, they meditate, spreading a heart full of love. The Pali word is metta, okay? Full of metta, to one direction, to the second, to the third, to the fourth. The same way above, below, across, everywhere, all around, a heart full of metta to the whole world. Abundant, Expensive, limitless, free of enmity and ill will. I'm going to explain this. The Buddha had this para replicated another three more times with karuna, compassion, mudita, empathetic joy, rejoicing, and upeka with equanimity. Hmm? Now I explain. I said earlier, the introduction of the word noble disciple was Buddha way of explaining his method of training and the result of training. And a disciple of his lineage will have the following mental qualities. He will not have covetousness, Ill will. Al-samuho. Right understanding. It means a mind that is not lost. Okay? The word unconfused, it is not that he's confused, meaning uh, you blur, blur. It is not that. It means that your mind has clarity. So I replaced it with the word understanding, correct understanding with very strong right mindfulness. Very strong right mindfulness means a mindfulness that has understanding of reality, of the nature of the mind properly, has proper understanding of the nature of the mind and is alert, awake, present with understanding. In other words, a noble disciple will have Panya Sila Samadhi. We're going to use the acronym PSS, okay? Panya Sila Samadhi. Wisdom, morality, concentration, presence of mind in the practice, presence of mind in daily life, in daily activity. And this presence of mind is just not just mindfulness. With just mindfulness, it's not called right mindfulness. Right mindfulness comes with, that mindfulness comes with understanding, comes with knowledge and wisdom. How much knowledge, how much wisdom depends on the individual. But being present in itself is not the end goal. It's not the end game. Being present with wrong views you can end up going all over the place. 
must be in being present with the correct understanding and right view. Correct understanding for noble truths. Correct understanding of noble truths. Correct understanding of Anicca Dukkha Anatta. What, what an earlier lecturer called ISN, impermanence, suffering, and non-self. That's the idea, okay? And the third point I wanted to make is this thing about Brahma Vihara. You see, uh, a noble disciple in our practice, one of the end games really is helping the mind diminish, diminish the sense of differentiation, dif deferring from another, differentiating from another. Our instinct, our regular human instinct is to see us and others as separate. We almost can't help it, see people separate. Meaning there is me, I, and then there is you and you all, separate people. As you begin to practice, as you begin to get rid of desire and ill will, and you, are, you, you cultivate clarity of mind on the Dhamma, you will start to see the world as no more than aggregates arising and fading away, rising, ceasing. And as you look at these aggregates rising and ceasing, and you begin to see how the same conditions that trap you and drive you are the same conditions that trap another and drive another. You will, as you begin to identify with others and their suffering, instead of being fixated with your own suffering, you, your mind will start to open up and start to embrace. It is this fading away, the fading away of the differentiation between us and them, that fading away that helps us to become more meta, rightly meta. Your, your love, your friendliness, your kindliness becomes pure because that kindliness is not sitting on greed, anger, ill will, the sense of I. No. This metta grows as it sits on non-craving. No more craving. No more ill will. Clarity of mind. Pure in the presence with deep, deep understanding of the Dhamma. Then, automatically, in this state of mind, this state of mind is, as the Buddha puts it, abundant. Everybody you embrace, expansive. You can see no limit to this mental energy. It, it stretches as far as your imagination, your imagination takes you. It just stretches. It embraces, it expands, it has no limit. And within it, there's so much joy. And, and it has, because it doesn't differentiate, there is no enmity, no ill will. Metta, karuna, compassion, mudita, rejoice, empathy, empathetic joy, and, uh, and equanimity. On another day, I will talk about the Brahma Vihara, but today, this is good enough to understand that these four mental states, they come together. When you start out, they are sequential. When you really understand and your practice and you consolidate your practice, as you consolidate your practice and understanding, these four becomes together. They are meshed together. And he said, the Buddha said, one the noble disciple, one who takes, who practices. The disciple is one who practices. Practices in his method will end up with this state of mind. Okay? And he said, no. Look at what they, he said. 
they spread their love, their compassion, their equanimity, and so on and so forth in all directions. It means that as they live life, this is not just sitting and meditating, this is life. As they live life, this is how they experience life. And their love and compassion encompasses every being with no limit, with no differentiation. Everyone is engulfed, embraced. So isn't that beautiful? The, the ultimate practitioner, the ultimate practitioner is literally the softest, the gentlest, the most loving, the most giving being. I lost, I, I'm speechless. Okay. Finally, we're talking about the four comforts. When that noble disciple has a mind that's free of enmity and ill will, uncorrupted, purified, they have won four consolations in the present life. Atan Sujato's translation for the word asasa, asasa is consolation. But asasa has also been translated as comfort. I actually prefer the word comfort. Consolation in the Singapore context with, you know, first price, second price, then consolation. Does it sound, that, that, for a Singaporean, it doesn't sound so, uh, so consoling. Comfort, in contrast, has a has a very very uh, comforting energy. Comfort is it's nice. Oh, my words are becoming a little limited. Okay, first consolation. Now I'm going to explain these four things. Huh? First consolation, or first comfort. If it turns out that there is another world, and good and bad deeds have results. In other words, kama, the kama vipaka. Then, when the body breaks up after death, I'll be reborn in a good place, a heavenly realm. This is the first comfort we have won, right? I mean, we all know this. We all believe this. You, you are all here. Everyone here is a Buddhist by choice or by birth. It doesn't matter. You have chosen. If it's by birth, you have chosen to remain a Buddhist. If it's by choice, welcome. And because you're a Buddhist, you accept that there is such a thing as rebirth and other realms. But the Kalamas who were present, not all of them agree to other realms and rebirths. So that's why the Buddha came out with number two. If it turns out that there is no other world, and good and bad deeds don't have results, don't have consequences. But in this life, I keep myself free of enmity and ill will are trouble and happy. Oh, so good. This is my second comfort. You understand this, right? If there were such a thing as other lives, then I know I die, I'll be reborn in a heavenly realm. First comfort. But if there isn't, even in life, if I stay good, if I choose to act wholesomely, remember what was said earlier? Motivated by wholesome, you act and speak. You do not cause harm to others. You will be happy and you will be trouble-free. It is for your welfare. No harm. So this is the second point. Even if there is no world, no other world, then it doesn't matter. I'm still a happy person and I, and, and I still enjoy this life, okay? Then comes three and four. If it turns out that bad things happen to people who do bad things, this is karma, the efficacy of karma. When you do bad things, will there be consequences? And he said, since I have no intentions, no bad intentions, I've not done anything bad, I, I won't suffer. There won't be bad things that happen to me. That's the point. It won't be that bad things happen. So this is the third comfort. The fourth one, which is rather cute because I actually had to do extra research to nail this, this, this translation down. 
You look at how it's said. If it turns out that bad things don't happen to people who do bad things, then I see myself pure on both sides. Full stop. Pure on both sides means what? So after some checks, and Bhikkhu Bodhi came up with this, two kinds of purification. Purification one, I didn't do anything bad, right? I'm, I'm, I do not do bad things. I do wholesome things only. First purification, I purify myself through good deeds. Second purification, your, if your mind is clean and pure enough, you can practice Brahma Vihara. So for those of you who talk about wanting to do metta meditation and all, your mind has to be very pure. You have to avoid all the akusala words and deeds. Then it's very easy for the mind to feel the metta and to cultivate that metta and have it blossoming in a massive way, that metta. Okay? It's in, a, it's in orange because the Kalamas were so, they were so affected by the words. They said, oh, so true. Oh, when a noble disciple has a mind that's free of enmity, awera chitto. Chitto is the mind, a mind that is, wera actually means enemy, anger, enemy, okay? Awera, no enemy. Aweya pacha, uh, sorry, abrap pacha, no ill will. So no enmity, no ill will, undefiled, pure. They have four comforts in the present life. Look at how the mind, how, how, what the Buddha said, huh? He always ends with pure. We start the chito, pure mind, purified mind. So, in our daily life, oops, previous, in our daily life, you must remember this. It is not enough. Not enough to stay, to have to control Akusala is not enough. You need to also get the mind to a Kusala mental state, a purified mental state. Okay? And then following that, they said, excellent Bhante. Excellent. Sadhu Bhante. We go for refuge to must. Ah, okay. The translation has a problem. Let me explain. This is, the, this is the original Pali word. Mayang, we. Bante, this is the sir. Huh? Bhagavantang, Bhagavantang is the blessed one. This is the one. This is the word. So it's been translated to Master Gautama, but actually it's Bhagavantang. Okay? Saranang Gachama. Go to, we go, Gachama, for refuge, the Dhamma, and the Bhikkhu Sangha. So actually, he, the, the, they say here, they go for refuge to Bhagawantang, to the monk, and Bhikkhu Sangha, the monk Sangha, the community of monks. Okay? And may the Buddha remember us as Upasake, lay followers, gone for refuge for life. Now this is very interesting because in the entire sutta, in this entire, entire Kalama Sutta, there was no mention at all for noble truths. In not so many words, eight four paths. He didn't mention eight four paths. He didn't mention tilakana or I agree gaze. You name it, he didn't mention it. There is no kodama here. But yet, an entire community of audience, of people, sitting there, listening to him talk about things that they know. All those kusala things, one whole chunk of it, they know. But he put it in such a way that they couldn't disagree with him. 
the point when they stopped disagreeing, that, they, they, that, which means that she shifted their mind from perplexed to completely receptive. At some point that happened. Where exactly, we don't know. But at some point in his talk, they went from, I am perplexed, I'm perplexed, to, wow, it's a good point, you know. Wow, I love this. This is beautiful. Finally, when he gave them the punchline, it was on the noble disciple. Because these guys want to know what is good, what should be done. And he's saying, if you are able to really, really eradicate the loba dosa in the mind, you will reach a point where the mind is completely empty of, absent of, any tinge of craving and wanting and any tinge of ill will. In the mind, because, because there is no ill will and no wanting, that mind as a natural state will become mindful, natural. And the mindfulness and that clarity, you just have to put in the Dhamma, you tampa in the Dhamma, the guy is home free. He's just off. He will take off. Okay, I think we've reached the, the last slide. This is the last slide. So what is the Kalama Sutta? What is the Kesa Mutia Sutta? It's a roadmap to a constructive and happy life. I was trying to think of a word for this. Do I say beneficial, do I say harmless? These are also words that you can use to a harmless and happy life, to a beneficial happy life. I like the word constructive. It, it's, it's more proactive. I chose this word because it's more proactive. And you think about it, right? In your mind, you're very careful not to let your loba dosa get ahead of you. Loba dosa more, how you do, you're careful not to let that get ahead of you. You are careful to keep the mind aloba, adosa. And as you understand the Dhamma, more and more amoha. Just on this basis alone, your life will be happier and more, more rewarding. You become, you become a source of refuge and comfort comfort, not just for yourself, but for others. This part, something to bear in mind, okay? Then, we want to apply, remember there were four segments, right? Let's see how we can apply each segment into our daily life, okay? The first one talks about the limitation of sources of knowledge. In other words, all our traditional sources of information, all the traditional way in which we gain information, we learn something. We learn something, we gain information, we, we grow that little bit. All the traditional ways, whether you hear from someone, you read from the books, you listen to your elders talk, or it is something that has been done by your family, all this, well, or you're very clever, you think, 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 and you came up logically, it works like that, logically, it works like that. Regardless of it, okay? Regardless of those. Any of those ways can be wrong. Maybe right, can be wrong. So then what do you do? Strike a balance between keeping an open mind but still preserving some degree of critical thinking. Where that balance is depends on the information, depends on the situation, and depends on you. What is that balance depends on you, depends on occasion. If you are, say, a profession, a, a professional, and in your profession, there are all these information gathered through the ages. Say law, all those law books, medicine, all the medical knowledge and information. You cannot go in and say, I don't believe, don't go by this, don't go by that, how are you practicing? You can't. You have to go by something. But keeping an open mind means I accept, I will listen, I will hear. 
Preserving critical thinking means I still need to think about it. I still need to reflect. I still need to see for myself how it works. So this is basic. But throughout it all, make sure that your moral compass doesn't switch. In your mind, you say this procedure has to be done because I can't make money. That's off already. Whether or not it has to be done, you, have, you, you, are, you are driven by greed. It's not very good. Keep it pure. I'm doing it for this person to the best of my ability. I help this person. This may work. This may not. We'll see how. And in the way that you convey the information, make it balanced. Don't put your ego in it and say it's my way or the highway. As I said, keeping an open mind is for learning and growth. You don't open your mind. You cannot hear. You can't, if you can't hear, you wouldn't learn. It's as simple as that. If you don't protect your critical thinking, then you are like a rubbish pit. You're like Wikipedia. Everything just dumb inside. Dumb, 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 dumb. Right or wrong, everything dumb inside, which is not very wise either. So we will, we will have to exercise some judgment. Critical thinking and judgment. I, I added some point here, which I thought it's good to highlight because we do have a problem, especially, especially if we, we know a subject very well, we kind of assume we know everything. Here on the Kalama Suttas, we are reminded to always keep your ears open and your, your mind open. So there may be something more to learn. There may be something else you will see from a different context. And, and be aware of your biases, prejudices. This is very important especially as practitioners knowing, knowing full well that what you have retained earlier, already sitting on moha, remember? It's because they're all sitting on moha. Just tell yourself, we don't know everything. And if we think we do know everything, then we are foregoing opportunity to learn. This is not very wise. So you remind yourself to, Continue to learn, to grow, to listen, and so on, okay? So this is about information management. In the way that we live life, based on the teachings of, the, it, it, in the teachings of the Dhamma, it's very clear. We have to be upholding sila for good reasons, for our welfare and happiness and for the welfare and happiness of others. And don't stop at just taming a kusala, stopping a kusala. You have to cultivate kusala, motivation, speech, and action. So you combine one and two. If you combine one and two, what does it tell you? Knowledge, the best type of knowledge are the, are the kind of information that helps you be a better person. That's fundamentally it. A nicer, better, kinder person. Any piece of, pieces of information that leads to you becoming, growing your loba, growing your dosa, and increasing your moha, you know, it is not a good idea to accumulate that information. So these two segments are not, they're not divorced. You can talk about them in a separated way, but you must put them together again because Kalama Sutta is one whole sutta. He led them from point A to point D, four points. So the same way, remembering first point, how we manage information and the best kind of information, the ones we must learn as much as we can, that kind of information has to do with us growing as practitioner, improving and growing as, as dhammas seekers, okay? As Buddhists, as good Buddhists. And any information, you just listen, any talk, any teaching, any writing that increases your loba and dosa, greed and anger, already the moha is there. You may not spot it, but it's there. So any information that causes you to doubt yourself, to increase your, your agitation, to one more and then all those pieces of information, put it aside first. Just put it aside first. 
go back to the ones that inspire, that causes you to know the direction of the path and you hit closely, carefully. Uh, all the time cultivate kusala, okay? A noble disciple means a practitioner who is making headway, diminishing the, the stains and purifying the mind. Fundamentally, it's that. So as you walk this path, okay, on noble living, I, I will just tweak, I will just um, uh, explain something a bit more, a little bit more. You see, there can be what I call the periodic noble living. And then there is the normal, a noble way of living. The periodic one means there are good days where you, maybe you did a really good, meditation or you are you on a retreat and you're you you had been upholding the sealer very well and you had been keeping and your mind you had successfully kept your mind kusala when that happens automatically the mind the the mental conditions are ready the mind is ready for samadhi meditation automatic you don't have to try so hard you just have to sit and the mind is present and it's happy and it's light and it's soft and it's malleable and it can see. It is receptive to the Dhamma information that arises in the mind. Okay. That is what I call the seasonal, the episodic noble living. Then there is noble living as a way of life. If your kusala has successfully negated neutralize the akusala. You are working on your anusaya level, the, the, the instinct level. You're starting to unearth and eradicate the akusala at the instinctive level to a point that the mind starts to change certain habits. Then noble living, noble way of life becomes increasingly possible. And what happens when that happens, right? Basically, you have less, less of your sense, less of a sense of the self, the I. You, you, you begin to identify very easily with other people's suffering. In fact, you will see and you will experience that actually the world has a lot of agitation and pain. It's a, almost a natural state for everyone else. And you, you, because your mind has much less akusala, you will very quickly feel the sense of gratitude, the sense of joy that you, you don't have that much of those pain. You feel sorry for others. You, the, the less of yourself, the less of you, you being preoccupied with yourself, the more you have space for others, the more you will embrace others. In order to get to that state, will require you to constantly reflect on wisdom, the noble truths, uphold the sila, and regularly, every day if you can, spare some time to meditate, to sit quietly, sit quietly and become in tune with the form and the mental states, the breathing. When you are able to do that on a daily basis, your sense of being at one, being at peace, will increase. This is Brahma Vihara. Your, your metta, your friendliness, your compassion, your... Um, your ability to rejoice for another when he's having a good time, your um, not being caught up with with all the equanimity. Equanimity means you are no longer affected. You are not so affected by the ups and the downs, the 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 pleasant and the unpleasant, the pain. It's just rising and falling for you. When you reach that 
kind of experience. This life is very beautiful. It's very, it's worth living. It is a life of comfort and peace. Okay. On the four comforts, the point I want to make is this. You reflect on these to help you affirm in your mind that you are practicing well, that you are on the right track, that being a Buddhist, upholding the path is the way you want to spend this life. And you hope this for comfort helps you at the, at the end point, let's assume you're not an arahan, right? At the end point, there will be a becoming. At that end point, this for comfort because it's so it because it is so um, assuring, it will increase your sadha, the sense of sadha, your faith. And sadha faith is a very powerful, light, gentle, happy mental energy. At the end of this life, you want all this joy to baffle you so that the next arising, it's a good arising. You there's no fear. There is hope, there is joy, there is lightness, okay? I actually have one more line, um, but I may not go into that. It, it's, it's actually just, just as a reminder to ourselves that these four segments of information, of uh, reflection, are particularly important in difficult times. Why? You think about, you, you look at COVID, right? All kinds of information will flood the social media all the time, on a daily basis. And after a while, it's like, I, I don't know what to, how to deal with this information. I think Kalamas is basically to, as a reminder that don't take everything as gospel. Take it with some pinch of salt. If it helps to calm people down and make people, if they feel that they can do something to protect themselves and the family, then you, 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 you proliferate that information. Help them to protect themselves. But don't proliferate information that scare people, frighten people. In the first place, you don't even know whether the information is right or wrong, real or not. And can you imagine ourselves just happily proliferating, whole oh, proliferate, more proliferate, everything also you get all over the place. You are basically messing up the already a very muddy pool, you just go in and you mess up more. I think as practitioners, we, we need to exercise some uh, restraint in how we push things out. How, what, what sort of information to share. That's all. It is, it's not pontificating to everyone. It's just a reminder that even in the Kalama Sutras, the Buddha had warned us against being caught up in information acquired in the traditional way. Information all has problems. So if we feel that a piece of info is going to alarm, it's going to cause uh, agitation, um, make people angry, forget it. You are not going to partake in that. Okay. And even during this period, all the more during this period, for me, all the more during this period, you must cultivate wholesome, Kusala motivation, speech, and action, all the more. Because this is the period where people are scared, people are worried, people have a lot of dukkha. When the world has a lot of dukkha, this is a time when your practice should shine. If you can manage your dukkha through letting go of all those agitations, if you can manage your dukkha, manage your akusala, you manage your akusala, the dukkha will fade. It's as simple as that. So when you manage the akusala, you're able to let go of the akusala, you're able to cultivate the akusala, you do it well enough, people around you can see that you, whatever that you believe in and whatever that you do is helping you cope. In fact, thrive. That all the more you must do, do by the path so that you can inspire others and motivate others to come to you and say, what are you doing right that we are not? Only then can you help. Okay? 
And I, I think for the others, um, noble way of living and all, it, it's the same point that I, that, I will, uh, that I have said before. The Brahma Vihara, compassion, metta, rejoicing for others, and being uh, equanimous, the ups and downs and all, it's relevant for all time to cultivate your mind to the level that you can experience this makes you able to live any life in any conditions with ease. That's the beauty of this practice. Okay, so um, I, I think I will stop here and I will take any questions. We don't have a lot of time, 337, not a lot of time. Um, I invite questions. Intrigued by your point. Okay, the question, I'm really intrigued by your point that all of us are actually just aggregates. And some are, all of us are not the same. You see, five aggregates, all beings, if you, if you think about it, right? Can, can you see my screen? Huh? Sorry. Okay, never mind. We are all five aggregates, right? Meaning to say, all individuals, everyone has rupa, vedana, which is feeling, sanya. Sanya is perception, translated as perception. But what it means is recognition. You see something, you recognize, that's it. That's how the mind clicks. You see, you, you, if you put attention on anything and you recognize it, you know what it is, at that point when you know that Sanya. Shankara is formation. The mind thinks. It starts to fabricate. It starts to create. It starts to construct. And then Vijnana is basically the experience. All these come together, you have an experience. The experience is Vijnana. Okay? If you think about it, everyone is like that. Everyone is this collection. And in everyone, for everyone, these five aggregates arise and fade at the same speed. There is no such thing as arise slower, drag on longer. It doesn't. They all arise and fade, arise and fade. It's an instantaneous experience. Moment to moment. For everyone, it's the same. Okay, when I say we are one of one and the same, we're saying that everyone will have experiences like this. The, how they experience the rupa, how they experience the vedana and sanya shankara, everyone has this kind. They are all think of it like bubbles, pimples. We are we are all clusters of pimples. Pimples not so nice. Bubbles. Okay, we are all clusters of bubbles all the time. The only problem is this bubble remembers selectively, plans selectively, plans and recalls, remembers, stores according to what I, what I pay attention to is often shaped by what I find pleasure in and what I find pain in. All of us have the same biases, okay? Our bias is to pleasure or pain. Everything in between, we all forget. You will register only these extremes. And as you remember these extremes, this is how you perceive that there is something real living through time. But the reality is we are all bubbles, popping all the time. We're bubbles popping, popping, popping all the time. We don't see us as bubbles and we don't see others as bubbles. So what we need to do in terms of the question is how do you practice? In daily life, become very aware of when your aggregates keeps shifting. Whether you use your sixth sense basis as your source of focus or you use aggregates in general as a source of focus, Six sense bases are embedded in the aggregates. Aggregates are embedded in the six sense bases. They are the same. 
but you can choose one which is more obvious to you. Okay, and you look at that, and you see from there, everyone, every, every experience comes and fades. And if you are able to consolidate clearly in your mind that experiences arise and fade all the time when you can consolidate the memory of fading as opposed to the memory of pleasure. It's the memory. We, if, you choose to focus, if you choose to focus on pleasure, then you will remember the object with pleasure, of pleasure. But if you choose to focus on the, the end, the change, the change over, your shifts, your shifts keeps changing. And if you focus on the changing shift as opposed to the object of desire, then your, your clinging will start to loosen. It's invariable, it's inevitable, it is just like that. Focusing on end and change allows you to become more detached to pleasure. Pleasure is, also, is nice only if you can imagine pleasure to be pleasure and, and you can, you, you're, there, there is this delusion in you that this pleasure can last. It's extended. It's worth clinging because it's a lasting experience. I can't think of a better word than a lasting experience. If you do not see pleasure as lasting, but you see pleasure as changing, then your clinging will change. Okay? Mm. How come I see two questions the same? Meaning of Panya Sila Samadhi as a way of life. Okay. Panya is wisdom. Sila is morality or kusala practice. Taming a kusala, cultivating kusala. Okay. And samadhi is what we call concentration. Eh? Being aware. The mind being present. Cultivating this requires you to... Be very clear again and again on a daily basis, again and again, reflect on each moment in terms of Four Noble Truths, meaning in a moment, is there craving? Is there dukkha? There is no, no craving, no dukkha. The co shows you when there is no craving, there is no dukkha. So there's one part. The other part is the impermanence of that moment. The moment keeps changing. The moment keeps, keeps morphing. The mind must register, change, change, no more, no more. It's no point holding on to the pleasure. It's not, not conducive for practice. It's harmful for practice. To go back to the past is to remember pleasure again or pain that you want to avoid. It doesn't matter. The point is the mind does this kind of gymnastic, right? It jumps to the past, it jumps to the future. It does this kind of gymnastic to revisit pleasure. Okay? PSS Panya means you will not keep doing that. You keep telling yourself all this revisiting of the pleasure is a it's, it's a temporary, it's a temporary enjoyment. It's not worth it. There will be more pain subsequently. If the pain, if you're, the, the, the attachment is strong, then it will lead to dukkha. Panya means keep reflecting along this line. Sila means at any time you feel in you a sense of agitation, that's dosa, meaning that it's a loba there. And we have to let it go. Let go of that feeling. Let go of that thought. Let go of a desire to keep talking about it. Drop it. Drop all these attachments to the Vedana, the feelings, attachment to your uh, views, attachment to your construction of thoughts. Drop all these things. These are the ones you can handle. And 
when you can do these things properly, the mind is naturally present. It is naturally in the state of knowing. It's natural. So for those of you who say, oh, I, I don't see a mind like that. My response to you is, therefore you have a lot of kusala akusala going crazy. A lot of arisings, a lot of arisings of kusala and akusala. In fact, more likely akusala than kusala. Usually kusala, they will temple off very quick after a while. It's the akusala that keeps coming. Then you say, don't have lay, I'm not a very akusala person. They are so subtle, you don't even realize it. For instance, you sit around when there's nothing to do and your mind suddenly say, I think I should go find something to eat. That's akusala. Already it's as reason. Then we go and act on it. Uh, trot, 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 trot to the, to the fridge. Pull it open or go into the ladder. Pull it open, get some things and munch. That's akusala. It's natural. It's very fast. Or if you do that, you say, ah, check my handphone, check my handphone. That's akusala, by the way. I'm not saying the act is akusala. I'm saying the intention. There is, there is a boredom. There is a sense of, oh, this is so boring. Let's go find something stimulating. And when you go find something stimulating, that is feeding the akus, feeding that, that, that desire. He said, can I feed mindfully? Well, you try. Lah. Your mindfulness won't last very long. You will feed, if you feed very mindfully, that desire will drop. In order to continue feeding, you will have to be unmindful. If you don't believe me, you go try it. You mindfully put the food into your mouth and you mindfully experience contact, 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 contact. Very quickly, there is no taste. There's only a blend taste there. In order to enjoy the food and derive pleasure from the eating, you have to drop that mindfulness a bit and focus instead, not on the contact, but you focus on, mm, I like the smell, mm, I like the, 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 the taste. Oh, next time I shall do it this way. You, your mind drifts and you can enjoy. And it's very cute. This is, this is just how our cute little mind works. Okay? So, PSS, Apanya Siddha Samadhi, literally incorporate um, the reflection on the Dhamma to the holding of the Siddha line to bringing forth that mindfulness and awareness as much as you can in daily life. Then you are incorporating it as a way of life. Okay? Kalama Sutta... Um, is it correct to say that sometimes we need to use our wisdom first before having faith? I, I'm usually quite wary about answering a question like this, correct or not. There is, to me, it's not correct or not. It's which one is helpful. So for some individual, having some preliminary faith helps them to connect and it's from a connection that they can open their mind to listen. If you look at the stories of many of the conversions during the time of the Buddha, right? A long time ago, in his time, when he first started out, he was black hair, he, he was 35, so he was very young and by the tradition of the days, by the practice of the day, he would have no audience because he's too young. He was too young. But still, he managed to convert many people, many intelligent people, including a king. And how did that happen? It's because there was a connection. If you like, we use a modern word called EQ. So they, they, they somehow click at that early stage. And in that click, it helped some of these individuals to open their mind. So when you say having wisdom first and faith, it's like I have to hear what you say first, then I go into your 
your I, I go into the practice. Well, that's great, but sometimes it doesn't work like that. You see, sometimes you do need that chemistry for for them to have that. I, I like I like the way you behave. I like the way you sound. I like the way you look. That that little click for that. Yeah, that connection. And then this person opens his ear and hear the Dhamma. What is very clear in our teaching is you cannot grow on the path without understanding. So that's why wisdom is very important. There has to be the correct understanding of a teaching and correct in such a way that the mind, the mind must spend time to reflect and apply and see the result. So there is a, co there is a co correlation. You, you listen, then you internalize, then you apply. And then after you have applied and you, become, you, you begin to see the effects of the application. And then you, can, then you say, ah, this is how it works. I see. And then you then then the faith will build up very fast. The the faith, the faith will then really help this individual grow quickly in the practice. The Kalamas didn't start with faith in the Buddha and, and so on. It's, it's really because of the situation, the condition. In those conditions, in that particular situation, if the Buddha had plunged into the scuffle and offered his teaching, what's he going to say? This is my teaching. I don't care if the others are right or wrong. This is my teaching. They are still there. to go, okay, there's just another point on the table. Ma. It's just another teaching on the table. He, doesn't want, he didn't want to do that. It would not have worked. So he would go in and say, this is how you know for yourself what should be done and why. You already know. Okay? Then they say, yes, I, I, like, I like this part, I like this part. Then he said the yuan already, right? He connected with them. Then he took them to the next level. Now I tell you something even better. That was how it works. Okay? So that was how he managed to take them into the Brahma Vihara. Actually, there's something else about Brahma Vihara here, which I didn't mention, but since the question was asked, I, can, I, I will talk about it. It also says that Brahma Vihara is not the unique property of Buddhists. Anyone, anyone whose mind is free from Loba and Dosa massively, uh, because his word was Vikata, we got the bija. Abija means read off. We got the biapada. Read off. Read of covetousness. Read of anger. Ill will. Completely not there. Asam muho. The mind has clarity and understanding. And they are mindful. So, Anyone with these kind of mental states are perfectly capable of experiencing the Brahma Vihara. It is not Buddhist. Okay? And you don't have to be practitioner. You can get your state, your mind, at any one time when your mind is free from craving and covetousness, free from anger and ill will, which actually is not that difficult. Okay? At that moment, when it is like that, and there is clarity and there's mindfulness present, the mind present in a moment, anytime you can go into the Brahma Vihara. At any time. And everyone who is experiencing Brahma Vihara will experience it in the same way. There is no, there is no my Brahma Vihara is more colorful than your Brahma Vihara. It doesn't work like that. All states of Brahma Vihara it's the same, okay? Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Shall I take the opportunity to thank you, uh, Sister Sylvia? Oh, uh, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for an, a most enriching talk. Uh, it's been such a gladdening experience to listen to the Dhamma. 
which has brought much joy, um, inspiration and comfort to us. Uh, we now have a better understanding of the Kalama Sutta, its interpretation, uh, and Buddha's pro profound message on the importance of how to lead a life of lasting welfare and happiness, and how to avoid lasting uh, harm and suffering. Um, the, big, the best takeaway, uh, Silver, uh, Sylvia, is how to practice. Okay. Um, also, thank you for the Q&A session. Uh, it has really cleared some of our doubts uh, and provided us with a springboard to investigate the Dhamma even further. And most of all, uh, inspired us to put it all into our daily practice. Yes. Um, let me express our gratitude and appreciation uh, to you for sharing your time and the precious Dhamma with us today. Uh, we have all benefited and I'm sure we've learned much from it. Please join us to say three sadhus to Sister Sylvia. Uh, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Um, we would like to uh, request Sister Sylvia uh, to lead us to the closing of this talk uh, with the sharing of merits with the devas all beings and to our dearly departed relatives. May I invite all of you in your mind think about the all sentient beings. You have found joy in the experience. Say it aloud. Ita water, chamehi and so on. Then we end with Itamania Tinang Kokoto. Okay? Just let's do it together. Eta Vata Chami Sabe <laughs> So now we will invite our departed beings to share in the marriage. <laughs>